The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Uh, next presentation was originally scheduled to be uh, given by Jean Corley. Uh, unfortunately, Jean uh, was unable to be here today, but I'm very pleased uh, to be able to announce that uh, Sharon Wood uh, is available here to uh, uh, present. Is it this, this presentation? Yes, it is. Okay. And uh, Sharon, thanks very much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Jack. So as, as Jack mentioned, uh, Gene called me last week. He uh, asked me to apologize that he was not able to be here, and he asked me to talk about um, ductile design of structural concrete walls. Um, you, you can see my version of the um, PCA book is slightly larger than the ones that Jack and, and Jim have presenting, were presenting earlier. I think this happened to be probably the second or third printing. Um, the PCA book, though, doesn't talk that much about walls. It talks about uh, bearing walls and infill walls, and it tells you that you need to design your frame to be ductile so that the walls, they provide initial stiffness, but when they start to fall apart in the earthquake, your frame can then carry on. Um, so if you, if you look at what is actually contained in the book, it had a little bit of information about how much reinforcement, distributed reinforcement you needed to put in walls. Um, so it's showing wall thicknesses of, of 6 to 12 inches and telling you you need two curtains of reinforcement if you have 10 or 12 inch walls. And then it has one diagram showing you detailing for walls, which um, I, don't, I think is consistent with the idea that the walls are not really contributing to the earthquake resistance in these cases. Now, the uh, 1964 Alaska earthquake actually gave some additional perspective on uh, wall behavior. This is the Mount McKinley building. Um, it was a 14-story um, bearing wall structure. It, had, um, it was constructed in 1952, and there were also interior car core walls. So this is a little bit earlier than the PCA book, but it wasn't that different uh, from the design approach in there. Uh, you can see from the plan that the, uh, there are frames in one direction, but they're not intended to provide the lateral resistance. It really is just a bearing wall structure. And if you look at the details for these walls, there is no doubt that these would be considered as non-ductile um, non walls. You can just see that the, we don't even have... Um, any type of tie going around the end or trying to tie the, uh, the two curtains of reinforcement together. So if you look at the performance of the Mount McKinley building, um, from a distance, you can see that there is severe cracking. Um, if you start looking at close-ups, uh, there is significant damage in all the coupling beams, so the perforation in these bearing walls. And then um, in the structural wall itself, you can see that those details really did not do very well. So I think that, um, that th this building, which came shortly after the publication of the, the first PCA book, w was showing us that if you want to get, uh, if you want to be able to accommodate larger deformations or have ductility in structural walls, you need to do something a little bit differently. And so this is the, the second PCA book um, or report that I'd like to talk about. It's a little hard to see the title here. It's um, Earthquake Resistant Structural Walls, Tests of Isolated Walls, 
Um, but these were a series of, of tests that were run at the Portland Cement Association in the mid to late 70s that I think really set the bar for telling you how, how to design ductile walls. Um, I also want to point out that I am a little bit at, at risk here. You'll notice that uh, Meta's uh, signature is up on the top of, the, of this uh, report. So I've now outed myself. He knows that um, I have his copies of these reports. So we'll worry about getting it back to you sometime soon, Meta. Um, anyway, what I'm going to talk about are, are the, the tests that were done at PCA. They really tried to, um, in a fairly concise experimental program, do a large number of parameters. They looked at longitudinal reinforcement ratios in the boundary elements, um, vertical and horizontal reinforcement ratios in the webs, axial stress, which is important, especially if you have a bearing wall type of structure. And then um, they did look only at slender walls. So the aspect ratio of these walls was 2.4. Um, they did try several different loading histories, and I'll give a, a brief uh, summary of that in a minute. But this is just to give you a feel for the, the, one of the primary experimental parameters that they looked at was the cross-section of the walls. So each of these walls was uh, 15 feet tall. The rectangular walls had a, um, uh, the, the length of the wall was 75 inches, and the, the thickness of the wall was uh, 4 inches. They then had uh, confined boundary elements or, or barbell shape where there were 12 inch by 12 inch um, confining elements at the end of the walls. And then here on the flanged walls, it was three feet wide and four inches thick. So the webs in all these cases were four inches thick. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, just to give you a feel for the, uh, the boundary elements were considered to be key. And in amongst the tests, they really had a wide range of transverse reinforcement that was used in these boundary elements. The first in each test series tended to have essentially the reinforcement you need to keep the bars in place, but nothing that you would define as confinement. And then as you moved later on in the, in the test series, they added more confinement. Um, the, uh, the transverse reinforcement would be spaced more closely in the boundary element than the, than the uh, wall reinforcement. This was particularly true in the barbell elements where there are very small wires with, um, wooden, with uh, modest hooks that were being used in, in the first series of tests. And later on, this looks like a, a confined column from a special moment frame. And these are a little more difficult to see, but these are the flanged walls where basically there's just um, one four inch, less than four inch kind of confined region here and, and in the more, um, the more elaborate testing that range of confinement extends much further in both directions within the wall. So if you uh, take the time to start looking at the response of these walls, one of the things that's really important is how, what is the, the maximum lateral force that you can resist in the wall? And um, Although we will colloquial define, colloquially define walls as being shear walls, a lot of the walls that were tested really were, um, did fail in flexure. And so the, the standard approach for determining the nominal flexural capacity of a linear strain variation could be used to determine a nominal moment capacity. You then have, the, because the load was only applied at the top of the wall, you could just translate that into a shear at the base of the wall. Or you could calculate the shear capacity um, essentially assuming that you have one-way shear the same way you would in a beam. Um, the one thing that's different in the, and I'm using here the uh, provisions in the current code, but this, this shear area that you're using is based on the, um, the entire cross-sectional width, so the thickness of the wall times the entire length of the wall, as opposed to a beam where you would only, you would base the, uh, base the cross-sectional area on the effective depth. Here you're using the total depth of the wall. And I'm going to define this term nominal capacity as being the minimum of the shear corresponding to a flexural failure or the shear corresponding to the shear failure. And so if you look at this, this variety of, um, of 19 different walls that were tested at PCA, what you find that is that in all cases under um, cyclic loading, the, beams, or the, the walls were able to resist forces that were higher than the nominal capacity that was defined in the code.
So there, there's no issue, there was no issue that was found with, with strength being too low in any of these walls. The, um, the walls themselves could be classified as having a flexural failure, and that typically was defined when um, the, the capacity was, was limited by something like buckling of a reinforcing bar, longitudinal reinforcing bar, or in this case it actually is fracture after buckling in the opposite direction. This happens to be uh, one of the walls that had a not very good confinement of the boundary element. And what you would find is if you take that same wall with the same nominal dimensions but increase the confinement, you actually are able to increase the deformation capacity. It, we're still having ball, bar fracture as what's limiting the final capacity, but by confining the boundary elements, you're improving the uh, cyclic response. Now, for the walls that, were, that fail, tended to fail in shear, what tended to happen is the, the web of the wall would crush under these cyclic loads, and that was what was limiting the response. Um, this, wall B6 here actually was nominally identical to wall B7. Um, the, tr the difference, though, was that the loading history was different. In one case, in one case, the in case of wall seven here, the cycles were kind of, where you'd have, they'd have three cycles at a given displacement, and then go to three cycles again and three cycles again. Whereas in, in the previous wall, um, they were alternating large and small cycles. So this turned out to be a much more aggressive um, loading history, and that's why it appears that it failed or. The, beam, the wall itself failed or a much lower displacement. So um, normally when we talk about the earthquake resistance of elements, we're very concerned about shear failures. And especially if you look at the design of frames, you want to make sure that you have ductile response. In the context of the walls, the, uh, the shear failures appeared in the form of web crushing. Um, in some cases, there was like a shear compression failure of the boundary elements. Um, in all cases, there was a concentration of shear at the base of the wall, but the, the shear failures were occurring after the longitudinal reinforcement in the wall had yielded. And so what you'll notice is that they did not have that much influence really on the, on the drift or the displacement capacity of the walls themselves. One thing that was interesting, though, is our, um, our nominal design equations really do not do a very good job of distinguishing between the walls that failed in flexure and the walls that failed in shear. The flexural failures are shown in the blue dots here. The orange dots are the ones that failed in shear. And under cyclic load, or this line represents where your calculated nominal capacity is the same for both. And you would expect that that would be the division between the two types of failure. But under cyclic loading, it actually, that, that boundary shifts. And so if your flexural strength is 80% of the nominal shear strength, for example, you will end up with a shear, shear failure under the, the uh, cyclic loads. Um, as I mentioned, the, the um, distinction between flexure and shear failure is not that significant when it comes to the, the displacement capacity. Here I'm, I'm plotting that in terms of the mean drift ratio. And so the, the blue dots down here failed in flexure. There are some that were considerably had higher drift capacities than the walls that failed in shear, but really most of the walls are sitting here between about one and a half and three percent drift. So there was not an appreciable difference. Um, this is a, a plot that came directly out of the, the um, PCA wall test, just showing you the backbone curves and comparing them. Wall B4 was subjected to monotonic loading. And, and the, um, all the other walls on here were, were subjected to, um, to a cyclic loading. The, the flexural failures are the ones that are down on the bottom, and, and these are the shear failures. So the, the, shear fail, the specimens that failed in shear were subjected to a higher shear stress. Um, they had slightly lower deflections at the top, but it wasn't uh, pronounced. The, the, shear, um, the maximum shear stress was really the, the critical quantity there. So uh, just to kind of to summarize the results of these PCA wall tests is that all the test specimens were able to sustain multiple loading cycles to drift ratios exceeding 1%. So they, they were able to demonstrate that much better performance than what we saw in the, like the Mount McKinley building is able to be achieved. 
The walls with the confined boundary elements were able to sustain a larger inelastic deformations, and that conclusion probably um, is what led to the requirement in, in 318 to have these really large confined boundary elements. Um, it took a long time before that was relaxed, and now the designer has a little more control over that. The walls um, that failed in shear experienced web crushing. They had slightly lower maximum inelastic deformations, but they still went into the inelastic region. And as I noted, the inelastic displacement did depend on the loading history, which makes it a little bit difficult for, for the designers then to decide what, what is definitely needed because you don't know the loading history in advance. Um, in terms of the, the shear capacity, this average shear stress, um, which is the maximum force in the walls um, that was resisted by the walls, the boundary between the flexural and the shear failures was right around 4 root F prime C. Um, if your uh, flexural capacity exceeded about 60% of the shear capacity, you were very likely to have uh, a shear failure under these cyclic loads. And then if you had a really low wall reinforcement ratio, you're susceptible to degradation of shear strength as the cycling continued. So this was an extremely comprehensive set of tests. And as I mentioned, I think it did set the tone for, um, for the design of structural walls in the ACI code for, for many years. I would like to end on a, uh, give you an update on the Mount McKinley building. I did not know this until I um, did a Google search last week. So the Mount McKinley building is now um, over 60 years old even older than, than the PCA book. I had always assumed that it was torn down after the 64 earthquake, and it was not. Um, it was, had been vacant for quite a while. There was the earthquake damage, and then in the um, 70s and 80s, there were some fire code issues. But it was resold in the 90s. It was um, repaired using CFRP wrapping, and it was reoccupied in 2006. So, um, it goes, I think that would be something that Dr. Corley would certainly like to talk about, which is how important concrete buildings are and how adaptable they are. So thank you very much.